I am a ball full of anxiety, so uh, we're going to pray one more time. <laughs> uh, God, I, I thank you, Father, that we can cast our cares upon you, and that today is a reminder, Lord, that um, a God who cares enough to come to the earth, a God who cares enough to die, a God who cares enough and is powerful enough to rise from the grave, um, Father, is powerful and caring enough to handle anything we have before us. Father, I thank you for the mom in this room, Lord, that after a year gets to sit with their family in church and you meet that mom in that place. Lord, I thank you for the moms in this room that long to sit with their family in church, Lord. I thank you for those, Father, that have has had the courage and, and are in the room, Father, and how you meet the people in the room. But Father, I also thank you that you meet the people watching behind a screen who struggle to, to come back through or are waiting or, or whatever it might be. But Father, we walk into this room on so, in so many different places. And yet you are large enough, big enough, caring enough to meet us all in this place. So Father, we love you and we thank you. I pray that you would be made famous, continue to be made famous, continue to do a work. We love you in your name. Amen. Amen. After church, uh, we're going to eat food uh, because that's what you do on Easter. Uh, carbs don't count on Easter. Jesus told us to eat bread. Uh, and so uh, carbs don't count. And, uh, and if you grew up like me, uh, you did, you're here. Uh, that's a silly statement. And, uh, but if you grew up eating food, like most human beings, uh, that you probably heard your mama say at some point while you were picking out on appetizers, you'll ruin your appetite. You'll ruin your dinner, right? Like your mama is cooking something good. There's prime rib coming. There's the, there's the ribeye coming. If you're a vegetarian, I've heard that they make cauliflower steak. It sounds disgusting, uh, but I hear they make that. Something delicious is coming, but your mom has the tenacity to put a potato skin. You're not supposed to eat while you're preaching. That's like rule number one in preaching <laughs> class. But you do that. You pig out, right, because it looks so good. She'll put the mozzarella sticks before you. You'll pig out. And you're like, come on, it's good. And you ruin your appetite. You'll ruin your appetite. And then the meal comes, and it's the, it's the ribeye, cooked perfectly, medium, all the spices. And you're like, this ribeye sucks. It tastes terrible. Well, does it taste terrible? Or did you just pick out on things that probably weren't as good, but in the moment it felt good? And then what was coming didn't taste as good. wasn't as desirable. But the person who didn't pig out on the appetizers, they're loving the steak. They're eating it all up. They're soaking in the juices. It tastes so good because they didn't pig out on the appetizers or they just had one. And now it tastes that much better. If I go to Chili's, my favorite restaurant, I'm going to eat that queso even though I know I have fajitas coming. And they're going to taste so good. I ruin the fajitas every single time on the queso. But it's other people. They don't do that and they enjoy the meal. See, Olive Garden, I, it's like for the Italians in the room, can I get an amen? That's real Italian. Not too many, no. Off offensive. People just turned off their computers. Uh, but if you go to Olive Garden, you can eat two breadsticks. You eat one breadstick to kind of get you ready for the meal. But then you save a second one. Why? Because you soak up all the sauce on your plate with the extra breadstick. The appetizers with the breadsticks at Olive Garden have a way of making the meal. Appetizers can make or break a meal. And for many of us, we've heard that saying, you'll ruin your appetite. In that moment, your mama is telling you, don't forget about what is coming. We walk into this room confused. We walk into this room fixated on what is before us. 
The disciples were doing the same thing. The disciples were lost with, with, man, like what is going on? This Holy Week thing, this like life seems to be turning upside down and Jesus has to meet them. Like I think he has to meet us in this moment to say, don't get lost in the moment. Don't get lost in, in the appetizer before you, but focus in on what is coming. And so here is, I want to look at John uh, chapter 14, where Jesus meets us in this place. John is, 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 is an eyewitness. He's one of the 12 homeboys that walked around with Jesus. He lived, breathed, he ate food. They, they did life together uh, for three years. And John, sometime later, writes an account of what he saw, what he witnessed. So this isn't some Joe Schmo. This is an eyewitness to the events of the life of Jesus. And he writes this. Let not your hearts be troubled. This is Jesus speaking. Believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. Where I am, you may be also. A few days before this, they're experiencing the triumphal entry where Jesus walks into town, rides into town on a donkey. And they're treating him like royalty. They're, 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 Hosanna, Hosanna. Like the, the disciples must think, like, this is great. Three years of like hard ministry, and now the king has arrived. And within a few days, Jesus is saying, I'm leaving. What do you mean you're leaving? I've, I've given up family. I've given up careers. I, for three years, blood, sweat, tears, and now you're leaving, and you're saying, sorry, I can't, you can't come yet? And Jesus classifies what he sees in them as a troubled heart. I think he meets us in our troubled hearts. But he gives the antidote. Believe. Believe in me. Believe in the Son. Believe in the form of trust. To trust is to rely upon something. To truly trust is to put your weight and your being in on something. You have, how many times have you sat in a chair? At this point in your life, maybe 4,000 times you have sat your, your badonkadonk onto a chair. Guess what? Every time you sit on a chair, your reasoning would say, I can trust this chair to hold me up. Short of that one time where your college buddy was a big old jerk, it's worked every single time for you to place your butt in a chair and it to hold you up. You do, you put your weight on something with the trust that it will care and take care of you. To trust and to believe in Jesus is to say he cares and he has the ability to hold us up. With that belief, with that trust, Jesus is saying here, come on guys, you know this. I'm leaving, but I'm coming back. I'm going to do something. I have a purpose in leaving. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I have to go to make preparations. In older translations, if you've read some, some different translations of the Bible, maybe you've quoted this as like, he's going to prepare a mansion. That's not the, the word that's being used here. The word that's being used here is Manoah, which is where we can eventually get the, the word abiding in a, an abode. What Jesus has in mind here as he's speaking this in, in a cultural setting is the person that would be married. They have a betrothal period. They have an engagement period. You and I are going to get married. Now the husband is going to go back to the family complex and build an addition to then have a ceremony and bring his wife back to the family complex to now their residence as he has prepared a place. Jesus is going someplace and he's inviting us to the family complex. Jesus is making it clear here that he's going to prepare heaven for us, but he's also talking to the troubled hearts of the disciples to say, I also need to prepare you for heaven. So here's what I want us to remember today. God with us is a forever thing. At the start of Jesus's life, you guys remember we, we celebrated Christmas just a few moons ago. And around Christmas, we say, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. We say, God with us. You've heard that phrase before, very likely. 
So at the start of Jesus' life, we know God with us, that God would walk among his people, that God would send his son. God with us was never intended to be a 33-year thing was never intended to be, you know what? God with us is just the life of Jesus on physical earth. God with us, and what I see here, it started and it ends, and it's a forever thing. That you and I as Christians, we don't don't celebrate God being temporarily with us. That he is for always with us, and he's bringing us with him. And so what I want us to see today is that God with us is a forever thing, and that must impact and change our ways here and now as we walked in here in a troubled state. First, it has to change us intellectually, where we know the way. God with us is a forever thing. Know the way. He says this, and and you know in the present tense, the uh, the way to where I am going. Thomas asks a logical question, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? He doesn't know the destination. He doesn't know the travel plans. There's no travel itinerary. And so he's, he's bringing out the confusion. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said it and he means it. If you, had not, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Jesus said to him, Lord, show us the father. It is enough for us. He just clearly said, I and the father are one. And Philip says, yeah, 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 Jesus, what about the father? I, can, I have to imagine this next statement is said with an element of hurt, an element of, really? <laughs> have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or else believe, if nothing else, on the uh, the account of the works themselves. Dear disciples, stop being fixated on a place. Stop being fixated on what is before you. Stop being fixated on a location, but get fixated on me that I'm going to prepare a place and that you have forever access to the Lord God Almighty. You have a forever relationship with God Almighty that I am the way, I am the truth, I I am the life, I am what will bring you to the ultimate location. I am the destination and I am the driver. And we, we say amen to that. But if we leave this room and we're having coffee uh, at the coffee shop, All of a sudden you say, I am the way, the truth. He said it, he's the only way, and he meant it. All of a sudden it becomes so offensive. Because what do you mean all roads don't lead to God? That he is the only way? Why is that offensive? It strikes a blow at our pride. That that we would have to say that we are wrong. That we would have to say that other ways are wrong. Yes, The brokenness of the world is why Jesus came. And so I do celebrate an all-inclusive Jesus who says, I want to bring everybody. He's not exclusive, like some yes, some no. These people yes, these people are dirtbags. He wants everybody. (laughs) But he says there is one way to get there. Everybody can come. But they better come through Jesus or they aren't coming at all. And so we celebrate Jesus who can speak with this level of authority, who can speak with this level of confidence, who can speak with this level of boldness because of what he said there. We, I am with the Father, the Father is with me. We are one. There is oneness. I speak with authority because Jesus is God. You don't know who God is. You get confused about God. Study the life of Jesus and you will be studying the life of God. They are one. To know Jesus is to know God. To see Jesus is to see God. And he reiterates 
go back to that place of belief. And, and if you can't get there, he says, just study the works. Study all that I have done. D disciples, the 12, my 12 homeboys, you, you were there when I made it, made it rain fish. You, you were there when, when, I, when, that, when that dead person came back to life with Lazarus and, and others. You, you were there when, when, when you, I was walking on water. You remember that? That was crazy. You, you remember that time that boat was all sorts of rocking? And I got up and said, be still. And it was. Like, look at the works and know that I'm not some average Joe. That my works prove the authority. My works prove everything I am saying. And so you may be walking here as well. We, don't, we aren't privy to the exact same things that the disciples were privy to. But my question to you is still, what do you make of Jesus? And so here's something that isn't in the Bible, but would speak of Jesus. This guy named Josephus, who was a Jewish historian during that day, who to everything that we can understand, never became a follower of Jesus, but was just writing historical accounts in that day. Here's what he says uh, in, in his historical book or whatever it was. Uh, at this time, there was a wise man called Jesus and his conduct was good. He, he was known to be uh, virtuous. Many people among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets had reported wonders. And the tribe of the Christians, so named after him, has not dispersed to this day. So here's somebody, if you want to say that this is all a bunch of like, you know, bull, then you know what, there's a count that's outside of the Bible that points to Jesus. I've never met anybody that says Jesus never existed, but I've met plenty of people that look at him as simply a good dude. What do you make of the person of Jesus? What proof can you show me that Jesus didn't raise, rise from the grave? What proof can you show me that he didn't live this earth? <clears throat> Truth is, you can't show me any proof. <laughs> Truth is, you, well, I'm sorry. You have that crazy YouTube video that says, you're right, I'm wrong. <laughs> you have that online blogger with all the spoofs and the comedians. Okay, what credible source could you show to me, maybe a .edu type thing, that would say, here's the proof that Jesus didn't rise from the grave? Jason, follow me over to the Holy Land. I'll show you his body. You can't say that. You can't visit his grave. And so in your theory of what to make with Jesus and his life, you come at me for my faith. We both look back on the life of Jesus and leave with an element of faith based on what we see and we conclude. And so you conclude, we might conclude, some might conclude that he is just a good dude. Well, I know a lot of good dudes that did not do the things that Jesus did, so perhaps he's more than that. Just a good dude, he claimed to be the son of man. So the son of God, what good dude that you see as a liar are you also willing to give the title good dude to? That what Jesus did, what he claimed to be, I and the Father, we are one, we are in each other. If you don't believe he's actually telling the truth, then you also have to conclude that this good dude is a lunatic. What lunatic are you willing to give the title good dude to? So perhaps this good dude is more than a good dude. And perhaps today to know the way is to know that he is not just a good dude, he's the good Lord. <laughs> and that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father but through the good Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we know that, and then we move to now do what? Go the way. He says this, Truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will be, like, greater than Jesus? 
Because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do. And the Father will be glorified in the Son. If, I, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. To ask in his name is to ask what he would ask. To want what he would want. If you walk into this room knowing that I am on keto, Graham knows that. He's a good friend of mine. And if you go to Graham saying, hey, Jason's asked for four slices of pizza. <laughs> Graham's going to say, you're a liar. <laughs> because I wouldn't ask that. At least not right now. <laughs> so to know Jesus, to be one with Jesus, is to go to prayer and ask what Jesus would ask. To desire what Jesus would desire. And he's saying, as you know the way, and then as you go the way, you better be to praying because greater things do I have for the church and the people that call on the name of Jesus. You walked in here feeling that you do not have purpose? Jesus died, rose again, he's up in heaven preparing, and he's left his earthly ministry for us to extend. Greater things will be done through us, through the church, greater in geography. We've gone more places than Jesus went in the nation of Israel. We've reached and we have preached to more ethnicities than Jesus has preached to. He's using the church to extend his ministry and you get to be a part of that day in and day out as a Christian to pick up where Jesus left off. So God wants to use you for greatness. It's time to go the way. God wants to do good works through you. It's time to go the way. It's time to pray what Jesus would want us to pray. God, make me more like your son. God, your will be done in my life. I'm looking at your son and he looks awesome. I need to be more like him. God, have your way from me, in me. And you go to the one with the confidence that he is able. You don't need to rely on yourself because he's the way. You don't need to live in uncertainty because he's the truth. And you don't need to fear death because he is the life. Reagan, uh, we had an Easter egg hunt like a week and a half ago or something like that. And... Uh, my wife uh, said that she was going to have a golden egg. Uh, and I was like, oh, cool, golden egg, great. And then she like, okay, but we need some cash. And I was like, oh, I hate this golden egg. <laughs> and, uh, and so there was going to be a golden egg with cash uh, in my yard someplace for people to find. And, uh, and Ava was talking about it all week. And uh, on Wednesday morning, a few days before the Easter egg hunt, uh, Ava, uh, Reagan, I, I was going out for a walk, and I kissed Reagan uh, you know, at 6 a.m., I kind of kiss all my kids goodbye as I go for a walk. Um, and uh, they get thousands of kisses that they'll never realize. All parents can relate to that. And, uh, and so I, I, I kiss Reagan and, uh, on her cheek, and she rolls over Wednesday morning, real tired. She's half asleep. And it's, the first thing she said to me was not, I love you. The first thing she said to me was not, good morning. She rolled over and said, Daddy... I will give you all of my Kit Kats if you tell me where the golden egg is. <laughs> she was apparently dreaming about it and thinking about it all night long. <laughs> and she knows the way to my heart is through a good Kit Kat. And now that, that's funny, and, and, I, and I laughed, and I was like, okay, sweetheart, why don't you just go back to bed? Daddy's not telling you. And uh, because her ask to me, as though we joke, her ask to me is also, Daddy, would you change your character for me? Daddy, would you change who you are to meet me in, a, in what I want? And I think too often we're trying to change the Father to be what we want instead of looking to be changed by the Father. In our bathrooms, and, and we have this sign that that hangs up. If you uh, have to go tinkle uh, after church today, you can read it. And uh, I'll read it to you. And I think this is something that gets misapplied often in our church. I'm going to read this and then let's walk through a good application and a bad application. It says, Wellspring Church welcomes those who are single or married, divorced or engaged, gay or straight. We welcome the filthy rich and the dirt poor. 
We welcome you if English is your second language. We also welcome those who are old as dirt, skinny as a rail, or could afford to lose a few pounds. We welcome you if you are dressed to the nines or the only, only, the only shirt on your back. We, we welcome anyone who can sing like Stevie Wonder or who very offensively, like our pastor, can't carry a tune in a bucket. We welcome, uh, you are welcomed here if you are just browsing, if you just woke up or you just got out of jail. We don't care if you are holier than Swiss cheese or haven't been to church since your nephew's baptism in 1988. We welcome the soccer moms, NASCAR dads, starving artists, tree huggers, latte sippers, nose pickers, tax collectors, veterans, vegetarians who like cauliflower steak, and junk food junkies. If you blew all of your offering money at the casino, you are welcomed here. If you uh, are ink pierced or both, you are in the right place. If you are in recovery or still addicted, we are happy to see you. Why? We welcome you because we have experienced the thrill of being welcomed by God. We too were once a mess, but God willingly welcomed us through the cross-stitched arms of Jesus. He gave his life so that you could experience real life, receive future hope, and be part of his forever family. And we say amen to that. That, that drives us. That, that is where we, we see. We want all people to come through our doors. We don't care the garbage that you walk in here with. We want everybody who thinks the church is going to burn down if I walk through the doors. <laughs> My God is pretty good at putting out fires. <laughs> we want you through our doors, but not for you to leave here and just experience a good time. That would be a bad application. A bad application that I can walk and be welcomed in, but you know what? I'll never be challenged would be a bad application. A good application is that we want you to walk in with all of your garbage and leave your garbage at the cross. Amen. We want you to walk in and like us be changed by Jesus. We want you to walk in looking nothing like Jesus and leave taking one step closer to Jesus. That is our desire, that we would know the way, and then we would go the way. So God with us is a forever thing. Know the way, then go the way. There's a meaning to the golden egg. I had to Google it, but apparently it's a big thing. I, I've seen more about golden eggs this Easter season than I probably ever had in my life. Uh, but Google says, uh, what does it symbolize? Uh, it's something rendered as a goose that laid a golden egg refers to someone or something that is a valuable source of money, power, or other advantages. So this represents really everything we want in life, right? Power, money, authority, like the good life. Many of us are trying, we have those cravings, and many of us are trying to find wealth to satisfy our craving. But really, that's fool's gold. You'll ruin your appetite. We're trying to gain more power to give our, ourselves the craving of, to satisfy the craving of more power, but you'll ruin your appetite. We're looking to our marriages to meet our every craving, but you'll ruin your appetite. We're looking to our kids to, to meet our every craving and be our every satisfaction, but really, you'll ruin your appetite. You're looking for that next promotion. You're striving for that, but really, if that's everything, you'll ruin your appetite. There is nothing in this world that can eternally satisfy you. It will all ruin your appetite. How many of us hear about Jesus, the prime rib, the ribeye, the tomahawk steak, and we're looking at him and saying garbage, when really we've just been filled with lesser things. We've had our fill with all of this world. There's an old song that says, you can have all this world, just, just give me Jesus. That's where you'll be eternally satisfied. My son found the golden egg, and he got the $10 inside. You know how long it lasted him? About 45 minutes. He traded the $10 for foam and silly putty. About $3 worth of garbage that he still can't tell you where it is right now. <laughs> the stuff that you'll find inside the golden egg that you're looking for here on earth 
won't last too long. But when you find Jesus, you find eternity. You find a relationship. So stop settling for appetizers and find your true satisfaction in the one that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You got a taste of Jesus today, and I'm prayerful right now in this moment that you want all of it. You want all of him. That you're going to leave this place saying, I don't want to be satisfied in this world any longer, but I'm going to leave here eternally satisfied in you, Jesus. The one who said, you know what, I understand you, you, you have a whole lot of sin in your life where you were trying to find satisfaction in other places. I'm going to die for that sin. I'm going to satisfy the wrath of God over your life by dying. And then I'm going to offer you life through my resurrection. And so in this moment, I want to just pray. And for those that have never truly found eternal satisfaction in Jesus, I want you to invite you to pray this right now. Would you bow and pray with me? God, I thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. I thank you for a cultural reminder to, um, to celebrate your resurrection. But Father, I thank you that we get to do this every day as Christians. <laughs> Lord, in this moment where people have never placed their faith in you, never placed their trust in you, have never put the weight of their lives upon you, Lord, would they simply pray something like this in the quietness of their seat or behind the screen that they're watching on? Dear Lord, I am sorry. I have tried finding satisfaction every place but you. I have done wrong, I have sinned, and I am sorry. Lord, today, I understand you sent your son to die for me. I understand he rose, and I understand that he's offering me life. Father, I am choosing your son. I am choosing his sacrifice, and I will be forever satisfied in the son. Make me more like him. In your name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, there are going to be a bunch of people walking around this building with Bibles. And inside is a reading plan and information on how to get involved in a starting point. If you prayed that, the enemy is going to throw everything at you to distract you and find your your satisfaction other places. Don't take the bait. Get your head into this book and know the truth that will let you know what is all a lie when it comes to false satisfactions. I think that we have a job as a church to go about the business of doing good works in our community so that people get a taste of God to then ignite a craving of wanting him to be their eternal satisfaction. We have the opportunity to be a good appetizer in our community, the Olive Garden breadsticks that set the stage and, and make that meal taste all that sweeter. This is our value that we think every Christian should value is a value called pray for one, where we are all about seeing more men and women, more children, more youth come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's going to impact how we pray. It's going to impact what we do in the coffee shop. It's going to impact what we do about uh, around the Easter dinner where Uncle Ted, who's a dirtbag, comes and visits. It's going to impact. We're going to pray, God, give me an opportunity. God, more people in your, commun- in your kingdom. God, it's not about my holy huddle. It's about building your kingdom. So one of the ways we did this as a church Corporately, at large, was on our birthday. I gave us a two-week goal. Let's raise some money to love those that are forgotten about in society. There's 600 kids in Ocean County that are in the foster care system. And so I challenged us, let's raise $8,000 in two weeks to come alongside four people to make them, train them, and, and to pay for them to be advocates in the legal system for these foster care kids because there's only 130 foster care advocates and so there's 470 that don't have an advocate to to walk around with them to help them through this to navigate this i was very fearful about a two-week eight thousand dollar goal putting before my people when we have budgets and we're already stretched thin but in faith we put it out there and god just wholly laughed at me (laughs) Because on Wednesday, Graham and I went to Casa uh, on Hooper Ave. 
and presented them a check for $17,900. More than double the faithfulness of God's people to wow a local organization. They said that depending on how long an advocate stays with them, that this would mean that we're going to come alongside 15 to 60 kids that don't have an advocate. Praise God for that. And so as we go into song, as we sing one more thing, as it gets wild in here, here's my challenge. As we've done this as an organization, my challenge for you right here and right now is to take that card on your seat. And this Easter weekend, because of your risen Savior, we love because he first loved us. Would you leave this place and I challenge you to whet somebody's appetite? Maybe they've never received a free cup of coffee. Maybe they have, have never seen that act of love of just like, oh, no, how are you really doing? Maybe it's just a, hey, I heard this happen. I'm just texting to check in on you. How are you doing? Maybe it's Uncle Ted who's never gotten an invite to Easter dinner and you're going to invite them today. Whatever this might be, how could you whet somebody's appetite to want more of Jesus that to perhaps they don't even know they want more of? I challenge you today to love somebody and let them know that God loves them and so do we. Would you guys stand and sing one more song with me?